tracking with us. Paul's been dealing with problems in the church in Corinth. Every church has problems because every church is filled with people like you and like me. And if you remember where we left off last week, Paul calls the Corinthians to judge one another. In other words, to deal with sin inside the church. Now, if you're here last week, Paul dealt with a man who was having sex with his father's wife. Interesting. Next week, we're going to cover sexual immorality and homosexuality. After that, divorce. Today, lawsuits among believers. And the hits just keep on coming. <laughs> and you are the only gathering that will laugh at that because only the old people know what that means. If you're young, just ask somebody older. It goes back to the 60s when the only way you could listen to music in your car was with a thing by the, called the radio. And you had no control over what was coming. Anyway, we live in a world that no longer knows how to solve disputes amicably. Instead, it's you wrong me, and I'm going to get you back. And maybe I'm even going to sue you. It's gotten ridiculous. I don't know if you uh, heard about this last week. CNN came out with a story. Congressman sues over olive pit. <laughs> Dennis Kucinich is no fan of pit-filled olives, and now he's doing something about it, taking one of Congress' cafeterias to court. In 2008, the Ohio Democrat purchased a sandwich filled with those olives at the cafeteria inside the Longworth office building. After biting into the wrap, he cracked a tooth, according to the legal complaint. Now he has come forward with a $150,000 lawsuit against the cafeteria for providing dangerous sandwiches. As a result, he says he has received, quote, serious and permanent dental and oral injuries and has sustained other damages as well, including significant pain, suffering, and loss of enjoyment. Loss of enjoyment. That's a new one. I think I'm going to divorce you because I don't enjoy you. Whatever. Dave Hughes, I think, is here this morning. Dave's one of our elders. His wife, Vicki, was in a car accident near Washington Square a few weeks ago. It was actually her fault. And uh, a couple weeks later, a letter comes in the mail to their daughter, Rachel, who's 18 and who's Down syndrome, asking if she would like some free legal counsel to pursue litigation. So Dave's going to write back and say, no, she doesn't want to sue her mother. <laughs> so this, this is the world that we live in. There are 1.2 million lawyers in America. We have more lawyers per capita than any other nation in the world, and we are world leaders at suing each other. And in a year not too far back, there were 12 million lawsuits filed in state courts and 200,000 filed in federal court in one year. But we're going to see from today's text, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that lawsuits are nothing new. Let's read the text that we're going to cover today, and then we will pray and get into the scriptures. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, Paul writes, if any of you has a dispute with another... Dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have, completely, you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers." Pray with me, Father, Lord, we thank you for your word, which is so applicable to everyday life. And Lord, we want to walk with you in this world that you've placed us in. I pray now that you would speak to each one of us personally. May we understand what your word says and what you want us to do with what we learn today. In Jesus' name, we ask for your help. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, hey, first a little background, and then we'll go back and unpack the text. Now, we don't know exactly what's going on here, but we do know that one man in the church in Corinth had, had defrauded his Christian brother, and in order to deal with his grievance, that man was, the, was taking the other guy before the civil magistrates at the Bema seat, which was publicly located right in the heart of the city. 
Now, in first century Roman Empire, there, there was a three-stage judicial process. The plaintiff would appear before one of the city's magistrates requesting a lawsuit. If the magistrate agreed that there were grounds for a suit, he'd summon the defendant. They'd discuss the charges together and then assign a judge agreeable to both parties. And then finally, the case would be heard by the judge and the sentence would be passed. But like today, going to court was a very expensive proposition. We have writings that tell us in AD 47 in a Roman colony in Spain, a lawyer could charge what amounted to nearly five times uh, more than the average person's salary. So think if somebody made $30,000 a year, a lawyer could charge you know, $140,000. And so what's the deal there? Well, only the wealthy could afford to go to court to sue somebody. The entire system was weighted in favor of people of higher status, those of the upper class. And another factor was the lawyer himself. If you had a lot of money, you could hire a lawyer who was gifted in rhetoric, who was a great speaker, an orator. In fact, people would pack out trials just to listen to some of the great lawyers speak. The point for us is, to see this going on in Corinth, we know that at least one, more likely both of these two believers, were well-to-do. They had money. And they had time, and they were hoping to exploit this system for a big reward. With that in mind, let's go back and unpack the text, just kind of one verse at a time. Look at verse 1. Paul says, if any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints. Two words that are important there, ungodly and saints. Paul begins with a question. He goes, why are you taking your grievance? Why are you airing your dirty laundry outside the church instead of dealing with it inside the church. If you're taking notes, the phrase has a dispute there is a technical term for a lawsuit. He's not talking about crimes. He's talking about disputes. He's not talking about criminal cases. He's talking about civil cases. Paul's not saying that believers should uh, never go to court. In fact, he's not even saying there isn't a time when a believer um, might need to sue. He's not saying that you don't go to court for acts of violence or murder or rape or drunk driving. He's talking about money and property issues, disputes over these kind of things, business agreements, money that was loaned and not paid back. Here, the one who's been wronged is going outside the church seeking adjudication instead of staying inside the church and finding mediation from some wise believers. Now, it isn't that the problem didn't need to be dealt with. The problem here is that the case is being brought before the ungodly, verse 1 says, instead of before the saints. The saints are God's people. Now, the fact that Paul is appalled by this, no pun intended, Paul is appalled, um, is seen in the ensuing questions. Look at two. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? In verse 1, Paul is directing his comments to the guy who's doing the suing, but now he speaks to the whole community here in verse 2 for its failure in allowing this to happen in the first place. Remember, he's saying you need to deal with sin inside the church. You're not supposed to judge those outside the church, but you are to deal with those inside the church. He's saying here the failure of these two men is also a failure of the church to be the church. He's talking about church discipline here. In verse 2, Paul ties this present problem, I want you to see this, to a future reality. Look at it again. He goes, don't you realize you're going to judge the world? What's that mean? <laughs> well, we don't have time this morning to look at a, a plethora of scriptures, but the Bible teaches that when Jesus returns as king and judge, God's people will somehow be involved in his final judgment on this world. We don't know exactly how, we just know that we will be involved. Paul's saying, don't you realize that one day you're going to judge the very world before whom you are now appearing asking for judgment? So what he's saying is this problem wasn't just a problem of bad ethics. It's, it's arising from bad theology. And if we're not careful, we can get sucked into the world we live in as well, not only to its bad ethics, but we can have bad theology. Crucial to Paul's line of thought is his view of the church as an eschatological community. Those who existence as God's future people should determine their conduct now. Are you tracking with me? This life, listen, Jamar and I say this all the time, but I don't think we can say it tonight, say it enough. This life is preparation for the age to come. God's readying you and me. He's helping you learn to live now like you 
will live then. Paul's really saying, you've forgotten who you are and where you're headed. See, because the church is the family of God, and it's an eternal family. The people sitting around you this morning who know Jesus, we're going to be with each other forever. Think about that for a second. You go, him? (laughs) Her? Yeah, turn to the person on your right and say, you're stuck with me forever. Do it right now. Okay, okay. Now turn to the person on your left and say, I'm glad Jesus isn't finished with you yet. Right, yeah. (laughs) And Jamark has nobody on his right or his left, so he needs prayer. Yeah. Verse 3, look at your Bible. Paul goes on, do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Not only will we judge the world, we're going to judge fallen angels, demons who rebelled against the God who made them. If that's the case, and it is, Paul's saying, can't you deal with a trivial dispute among the two of you? Verse 4, therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. Now, there's two ways of reading verse 4. The NIV isn't the greatest translation here, in my opinion. It's better to see verse 4 as a question, which some of your Bibles do. I think the NIV in the notes as well. Paul is saying, when you have a dispute among yourselves, why do you entrust them to those whose jurisdiction is outside the church, men who count for nothing inside the community? Now, he's not saying that secular judges, you should rebel against them, and who are they? He's just saying, why are you going outside to talk to somebody whose jurisdiction is outside instead of saying, staying inside the church and letting brothers and sisters who are mature in Jesus handle the dispute? Verse 5, I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? Now, Paul's getting really sarcastic here. If you remember, the Corinthians prided themselves in sophistry, which was wisdom. Paul's saying, you guys brag about how wise you are, yet you can't find one sophist, one wise person among you who can handle a dispute between two guys. He said, I say this to shame you, literally to move you to shame. It's like some of you had your parents say to you, you ought to be what? Ashamed of yourself. (laughs) That's what he's saying. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Now, remember, in Jewish culture and the culture of Paul's day, this was an honor-shame society, not like our society. We're hyper-individualistic. I do what I want, and I don't care what you think. This was an honor-shame society. Remember, this letter is being read publicly to the whole church. These two people are being called out in front of the whole church. Can you imagine Jamark or me getting up here in front of all of you, all six services, and calling out two people who are suing each other, at each other, and refusing to let mature, godly men, elders, whoever, mediate, and we call you out by name. (laughs) Well, in our society, you just like, sue me. All of a sudden, I'd get sued. Chris would get sued for turning on my microphone. Todd would get sued because he opened the building up. My dog would get sued because he likes me. Whatever. We'd, We'd sue everything, all the way to the olive pits I eat. Anyway, not here. This was an honor, shame society. Paul is trying to use this to move them to do the right thing, the thing that honors Jesus. And by the way, here at Solid Rock, there are wise men and women all over the place. Not just the elders, but in house churches everywhere. Godly men and women who can mediate and help deal with these kinds of things. And that's where you should take them. Be it marital, be it material, with your family, that's where you should go. Verse 6, he goes on, but instead... You're not doing that. One brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. He goes right out in the open at the Bama seat. In the center of town, you are airing your dirty laundry, so to speak, in a public forum, right in front of the very people to whom the church is to bring the love of Jesus. Instead of pulling people toward Jesus, you're pushing them away. Seven. The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. He's saying whether you win or lose the suit by taking this action, you've already lost. Your witness is shot. You've already dishonored Jesus, so whether you win or lose, get your money, you've already lost. You're not living in light of eternity is what he's saying. You ought to be living as a community (laughs) 
with eternity in mind. He goes on, why not rather be wronged, verse 7? Why not rather be cheated or defrauded is the word there. Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Why not rather be wronged? (laughs) Wow, think about that for a second. Before you met Jesus, that might have sounded crazy, but not now. Unfortunately, too many of us can give a thousand reasons why not, and they all begin with the word but. We hear it all the time here. We say to somebody, this is what the scriptures say. Yeah, but you don't understand what he did to me. But you really, you have no grounds to divorce. Yeah, but you don't know how bad, bad my marriage is. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but you don't know. You don't understand. You don't understand how I feel. And how I feel is elevated over what God says. Well, this is what's going on here. Pretty easy to understand. So what's it mean for you and me? Because here's the deal. Out of the thousands of people that have come to Solid Rock this weekend, last night, and today, I don't know of anybody in the church who's suing somebody else. So you say, well, then this sermon is irrelevant, right? Yes or no? No. Now, there may be somebody who's suing another believer, and I hope that right now you repent and you go to mediation today. Come to one of the leaders here and just say, hey, I need you to sit down with me and -and so-and-so and help us work this thing out. And if it's a marital issue that's getting worse and worse and worse, I hope you come to the church and say, help us. We need help. Humble yourself and come. But there's three things that, that I want us to take away today from today's teaching, because I think behind this act of suing here at, in Corinth is, is the bigger issue of how to deal with situations when there's a dispute between another brother or sister, when you feel that you have been wrong. And if you're taking notes, write them down. If you're not taking notes, write them down. Number one, as Jesus followers, we're called to live differently. We're called to live differently. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8 says, You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In other words, you're not the person you used to be. You're a new creation, the Bible says. Now live like it. Don't live like you used to live. If you're truly saved, you're going to live in a new way. As a follower of Jesus, people should see Jesus in you, not just by what you say, should be by what you say and how you speak. There should be gracious words coming from your mouth, not crude talk and worldly stuff. But they should more than that see it, see him by how you live. Now, I couldn't help but think of the Sermon on the Mount. You don't need to turn there this morning. But Matthew 5, Jesus said this. This is Jesus speaking. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your who? enemies. He says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Listen, here's why. In order that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. In other words, I call you to live differently. If you're a son of my father who is in heaven, I want you to love even your enemies. And these two guys were brothers in the church and couldn't even love each other. Jesus said, not only am I asking that of you, I'm asking that you love your enemies that you love your neighbor as yourself. See, when we're wronged by someone, we want justice for them. But have you noticed when you do the wrong and you know you're in trouble, you don't want justice, you want what? Mercy. (laughs) Justice for you. Mercy for me, please. That's us in the flesh. But we're called to live differently. So here's my question for you. What does living differently look like for you? today. Now, I don't know about you if you've ever been cheated. In the crowd this size, some of you have been defrauded or cheated. The, The word here actually means swindled out of some money. Well, Paul says right here in verse seven, why not rather be wronged? He's actually saying, why don't you just permit yourself to be robbed for the sake of the gospel? Now, this has happened to me, and it's happened to some of you here today, but uh, it happened to me in a huge way. You know, when back in the the 80s when we were living in in California, um, my wife and I entered into an investment and was secured with a note and everything, and, and we were completely swindled out of what was a very large sum of money to us, and the person who was investing it 
said, this is, this is John Mark's college education. And, and so, uh, <laughs> sorry, John Mark. <laughs> anyway, uh, <clears throat> but to make matters worse, this guy was my senior pastor. And, uh, and not only were, was, Diane and I were swindled out of some money, but another uh, pastor that was there was also swindled out of what was a sizable amount of money to us. And we figured out pretty quick something was fishy when we asked to get some of it out. And there was excuses. And after a while, we tried to get it out again. Oh, I can't get it for you on the 30th of the month. Finally, we realized that money's not there. It never was there. We've been cheated. Now, this is a fairly large church in a fairly small town. So what are you going to do? I mean, it would have gotten out. You know, associate pastor sues senior pastor. You know, that wouldn't have been the greatest witness, would it? And so what do you do? So, well, we went to the elder. And by the way, the guy was let go over other issues. That was just a... a pebble of the problems that were going on. No time to tell you the whole story. But without giving details, um, we brought it to the elders, and the elders handled it uh, in a way which actually I didn't agree with, because they decided to do nothing about it. While this guy got a six-month severance package as he went out the door, walked out of the meeting saying, got my golden parachute. And so I'm not going to tell you that wasn't hard. That was tough to deal with, and um, it was really hard for my wife to deal with it. <laughs> Took her a long time to work this through. In fact, she still says, if I see him on the street, I'm going to say, you owe me some money. <laughs> and, uh, you know, yeah. And Joe Mark says, give it to me. It's for my college education. <laughs> tough, buddy. <laughs> Too late for you. Your little brother. Anyway, uh, you know, like Diane's a godly woman. You guys hear me talk about her all the time. But like, don't mess with the money. This don't swindle her out of the money that's supposed to be her kids' college education. Ah, mama bear. You know. So you know, I'm not. I'm, I hesitated to use this example to make. You know, I don't like to do things that look look how spiritual we are. It was hard. It was tough to work through. Forgiveness had to be extended, and um, and it was a tough thing. But here's the deal: to follow Jesus, you're going to take a hit at times. It may cost you something. Are you ready to let that happen? A lot of Christians say, no way. You know, I didn't sign up for that. I signed up for God's supposed to love me and take care of me and give me everything I want when I want it. But here's the deal. Over the next couple years, I wish I had time to tell you the other side of the story. God completely made it up to us in miraculous ways. Now, we had to go with what was going on there. We didn't know that would happen, but it did happen. Isn't that just the way the Lord is? We're called to live differently. What does that look like for you? Second takeaway, if you're taking notes. What do you do if you've been treated unjustly by someone in the church and they refuse to sit down and work it out? In other words, you try to go to mediation, the other party refuses. Because the Bible says, as far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. What if the other person won't? Glad you asked. Turn to the right in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. What do you do if you try to let someone in the church mediate, but the other person won't? How do you handle that? You see, every one of us either has been or will be wronged by someone within the community of Jesus' followers. By the way, most of the time, it's minor, and it just needs to be forgiven. You just need to, it just needs to be covered. But every family has conflict, every marriage has conflict, every church has conflict because it's full of people who sin. And there are times when you're going to be called to suffer, to forgo your rights for the sake of the gospel. And by the way, that's one of the signs that you're really walking with Jesus. When you actually, when you're making decisions, you don't just consider what you want, your rights, but you actually consider your witness before a non-believing world. You actually consider the other person and what God would have for them. Now, I'm going to walk us through a passage here in 1 Peter chapter 2. And as we do, uh, I want to give you three do's and two don'ts of how to handle it when you're treated unjustly. Verse 19, Peter's writing, and we're just going to pick it up right there. For this finds favor, he says, if for the sake of conscience toward God, a man bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. That's what we're talking about here. When you're being treated unjustly. 20, he says something interesting here. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? In other words, look, if you sin yourself, you say, oh, I'm being so patient because my life is such a mess, but it was your own fault. What's that? 
said, but if you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure it. This finds favor with God. Now look at 21. For you have been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an what? Example for you to follow in his steps. If you're taking notes, the first thing, this is one of the do's, follow the example of Jesus. And we're going to see what that is. Follow the example of Jesus. It says, Peter says, Jesus left you an example to follow. That word example in Greek, hupogrammas, it means trace your life after him. It was used when little Jewish children were learning the alphabet. They would trace the letters over the hupogrammas. So he, Peter's saying, just trace your life after Jesus. Look at how he lived and copy him. So the first thing you do when you're suffering unjustly is follow the example of Jesus. Number two is forgive. Yes, go to mediation, but, but, but you have to just, before you even go to mediation, you need to forgive the other person. Ephesians says, forgive just as God has also forgiven you. He's forgiven you all your sins. Forgiveness is, is a must. Again, Jesus is, is your example. After, after they spit upon him, mocked him, slapped him, stripped him naked, humiliated him, while hanging on the cross to the very men who were crucifying him, he said, Father, what? Forgive them. They know not what they do. Talk about suffering unjustly. The Son of God. <laughs> and he says, Father, forgive them. They don't even really understand what they're doing. He is our example. Follow the example of Jesus. Number two, forgive. Look at 22 now in 1 Peter here. It goes on. Jesus, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. Number three, if you're taking notes, third thing, this is another thing to do. You follow the example of Jesus, you forgive. The third thing you do is you don't sin and you don't slander. Be careful that you don't sin while you're being treated unjustly. And you don't slander. Don't go around bad-mouthing the person who has wronged you. Take your hurt and your pain to Jesus. By all means, talk to him about it, but don't go around bad-mouthing people. Don't sin and don't slander. Verse 23, speaking of Jesus, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. The NIV says it this way. I like it. While they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. Number four, if you're taking notes, what do you do when you're suffering unjustly? Don't retaliate. Don't say, you hurt me, so I'm going to hurt you back. In fact, I'm going to sue you. Jesus didn't retaliate. While being reviled, he didn't revile in return. While they were insulting him and spitting on him and mocking him and crucifying him, he didn't retaliate. By the way, vindictiveness will eat you alive. My wife and I are watching this happen right now with someone close to us. We just won't let it go. And, and it's, it's getting uglier and uglier and uglier. It will eat you alive. Don't retaliate. Verse 23 goes on about Jesus. While suffering, he uttered no threats. Now look at this next line. But kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. The last thing is entrust yourself to God. Follow the example of Jesus. Forgive. Don't sin and don't slander. Don't retaliate. And here's the third thing you should do. Entrust yourself to God. You say, Lord, this situation is a mess. I'm being completely wrong, but I'm giving it to you. And I'm going to trust that you're going to take care of me and you're going to work this situation out. And then Peter wraps up 24, and he himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. What's that mean? That we might live differently. We're called to live differently. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually straying like sheep, but now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. Just entrust yourself to him. He's your shepherd. He's the guardian of your soul. He's the one who's ready in you for eternity. He loves you more than you can even understand. Just entrust yourself and the situation to him. Now, lastly, and we'll wrap up this morning, there's a third takeaway. If you're taking notes, here it is. When you're wronged and you deal with it 
properly, you enter into the real meaning of the cross. You enter into the real meaning of the cross. Let me explain to you what I mean by that. In 7, he says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated or swindled? Here's the deal. When you're, when you're unjustly suffering, when you choose not to retaliate, when you allow yourself to be mistreated because it's the right thing to do in the situation, instead of demanding your rights, you entrust yourself to him who judges righteously, you will see the cross at work in your life. Not just Jesus hanging on it, but the cross at work in your life as you die to the self-life and you think not what I want, but what God wants. Not my will, but your will be done. You'll experience and understand in a deeper way what Paul called in Philippians chapter 3, the fellowship of his sufferings. Not only will you be like Jesus, this is where you'll really get to know Jesus. See, it's in, none of us like this, but let's face it. If I asked you this question, when did you grow the most? When everything was wonderful and easy or when you went through a hard time? How many of you would say through a hard time? Yeah, because either then you just either turn away from God and get angry or you turn to God. You have to do one or the other. And if you turn to, towards him and you let the cross work in your life, that's where you will truly get to know him. Hallelujah. Yes, amen. You'll become like him. Because you'll be living like he lived. Not like the world around you that's suing the pants off everybody they can see even over all of pits. You won't be like that. I don't know about you, but I want to live like him. And I know I need to get to know him better. Are you the same? Amen. Let's pray.